so and so has not responded to a request for comment. One day at the school newspaper, four years ago, when I was writing a joke article about a teacher who dressed up as a janitor for Halloween, I myself came across this overused, almost cliché line. So and so has not responded to a request for comment. I mean, I'm sure you've all heard of it, but the deadline was pushing tight, and I had barely enough time to expect a joking email reply from the teacher. So what happened was I ended up sending the email without expecting it to be replied in time, while simultaneously publishing my article. Gradually, I got hooked onto the atmosphere of a school newspaper and the hectic but industrious cycle of work, edit, publish. Work, edit, publish. On and on and on. And as I grew up, I went to work for more outlets. So I sort of rode my way through adolescence. And with a lifetime of pouring over periodicals, both large and small, I've seen the good, bad, and ugly of journalism. The main takeaway I eventually got from this tumultuous time actually became something that I hadn't previously realized, but was so much more akin to what I first saw when I write about a random teacher not having yet responded to a request for comment. I formed a vendetta against journalism. Sweeping as though my claim is, my main target is the element of sensationalization in journalism. Well, what is sensationalization? It's feeding exaggeration and then using that as fuel for emotional responses, then continuing to create a cycle by leading to its increase in consumption. Now, this, originally a part of journalism for entertainment, has been unavoidably linked with journalism for information. These two parts should be distinct, however, for very obvious reasons. Passing fact checkers should not make us ignorant about the effect we can have on our readers because we recognize that we manipulate them with technically correct content that insinuates something far more sinister. And this occurs under the golden standard of so-called press scrutiny, where the press is expected to be probing and investigative in the search for truth. Sadly, this is not often the case, and we are not obligated to expose these insinuations. We all know how to write between the lines because we know our readers can read between them. But this power needs to be used with respect and caution. A power that I see no practicable limits to. So this is my vendetta. This is how we, as journalists, tell you what to love and what to hate. Indoctrinate you, your private and public opinions. And form a propaganda machine to drive agendas forward. This is especially problematic because even I, as a year 8 student, can understand this. More views equals more profit, and in this sense, a higher readership is more valued than the accuracy of the idea, which is problematic in so many ways. As a student never having written for profit before, I can even understand this. Now, today, the global public is still shaken by Brexit, which was taken advantage of by us journalists. We made two extreme sides of the debate, pushing people to two polarized opinions. And now, I'd like to ask you to take a look at the slide. Well, the first one seems relatively normal, but the next ones all involve divisive word choices. The idea of my deal overemphasizes the notion of ownership of a country's future by one single individual. The contrast with the suit pushes the idea of authority pressing decisions against the will of the people. Now, here, a question is very clearly conveyed. In order to provoke an emotional response, you can look at the bare team and the idea of fighting, which really, again, pushes this idea of aggression. And finally, well, Brexit. Is that eye-catching to people considering purchasing this newspaper? Yes. Is it, however, an objective and factual representation of the real-life situation? Probably not. 
But, and in fact, journalism has such a huge impact on politics and can do so much to shape the political arena. Sensationalization in news, however, is not itself news to me. A more historical, high-profile example is Fatih Arbuckle's case. Now, Fatih Arbuckle was a leading silent movie director and actor in the late 1930s, and he was accused of murder. Well, contrary to the presumptions of innocence, the words we used, suspect, accused, and charged, they quickly changed to take on a new meaning. This new meaning, which then on, which from that point on, was used by us to create these images. And what these images did to us was palpable. Because even after the jury used only six minutes to determine that, in reality, in a court of law, Patty Arbuckle was not guilty at all, this eventually led to him losing his regard, his reputation, and his career. This quickly, our tendency to come up with words that tug at your heartstrings for information had irreversibly destroyed an innocent man's career. Well, objectively speaking, people being affected by journalism happens far more often than we realize. Fatih Abakul's case generated more copies sold than any event for a newspaper since World War I. And, of course, it is important to note that journalism has such a huge effect, but a lot of the times we can't give it credit for where it's due because we don't even know that people can become affected. Take my example about the teacher who just as a janitor, for instance. People will never know that he didn't get a chance to reply back to me. And that is exactly the crux of our matter because feelings don't care about your facts. Now, some will disagree with me. Idealists say that the press has to scrutinize everything in theory and cover subjects solely based on people's concerns. Now, that is usually the main argument against my current position. But I'd like to ask, what happens then when, under the guise of press scrutiny, selective scrutiny is employed tactically to cherry pick evidence that we then use to sculpt girders for agendas? And what happens when we report allegations, knowing full well that with persistent repetition, these allegations will be interpreted as the truth? And then who can tell me what happens when we do not acknowledge the widespread sensationalization that, in the name of public concern, taps into humanity's hardwired drives for social participation and causes the public to have moral panics? Of course. We have a duty and a responsibility as writers, but just because we have an ability to navigate around the crosshairs of regulation doesn't give us the green light to continue manipulating. Sometimes, journalists are even awarded for their efforts. During the second Red Scare in America, a period of time when the public was extremely concerned about communism, a prominent writer, Walter Winshaw, took advantage of this paranoia. He, among others, created a fear of communism in what is now known as the beginning of the ideological Cold War. Being read by over 50 million people a day, a single day, which, considering the population of America, is hugely significant. Effectively, this works as a propaganda machine for the American government's agendas and had a huge effect on generating the fear of communism. Well then, as you can see, journalism has a huge impact, and undeniably, this impact has detrimental effects on our society. The adage, boring is better, is always applicable here, because it means that we get the truth. Something which should be more important than whether or not a piece of news is sensationalized. After all, our primary purpose is to inform. Therefore, News should not be sensationalized, as it becomes misleading, and hence, untruthful. But the pole is always there. The pole to weaponize our words. The pole to generate more views, even though it may not be the best for society. I implore you all to watch out for this pole, because journalism is a key player in defending society.
from extremism, exploitation, and embezzlement. What we need to now do is to pay attention to these hazards caused and try to change what we can. But why am I telling you this? Why is this important? Because we're actually all stakeholders here. Every single one of us in this room is directly affected by journalism, whether we want to or not. We all need the reassurance that when one of us appears in the news, our stories aren't going to be taken advantage of. With this in mind, I hope we can take advantage of this knowledge and face the dire situation. Well, how should we then solve this problem? Since journalism is mainly focused on producing more of what people want to see, if we decrease the interest in sensationalized journalism, then perhaps the prevalence of sensationalized journalism is also going to decrease. We need to incorporate independent and critical thinking to run headlines past common sense. We need to always take a look at the bigger picture and examine multiple sides of an issue. We need to avoid making good guys and bad guys out of the situation and instead arrive at conclusions individually after reading widely. Of course, this is all fair and easy for me to say, but what I can say with confidence is that it will be a difficult thing to achieve. After all, excitement and emotions are in our very nature. We shouldn't expect success on the first try. But gradually, with these successions of insurmountable challenges gradually building up, I'd like you all to hold one thought. If this all ends up working out, I am certain that we can be a part of our next generation's hopes and dreams for a time in the future that I cannot yet comprehend. The dawn of such an era, though, thus indicated that perhaps I might retract my vendetta. Thank you.